it's really kind of intimidating to be up here teaching in the Havarim series because I've sat at the feet of Dwight Pryor in Jerusalem and I know the vision and the scope of this ministry and it is one of my most respected ministries ever. <laughs> and really, I consider myself small fry when it comes to stepping into such big boots as those established by Dwight and now following by James. So, so here I am. People sometimes want to know a little bit of background about the speaker and that helps them to paint a picture. So I'm going to just give you a couple of minutes of background. I'm originally from San Jose, California and came from a Catholic background, entered the Jesus movement in the late 1960s. There are people here today who remember the Jesus movement <laughs> and the late 1960s. Went to a little Bible college in San Jose called Northern California Bible College. It wasn't even an accredited school at the time. Met my husband at our church there. He was my teacher of Greek. And so I, the rest is history. I married my Greek teacher. I got a good grade in the class, but not for that reason. <laughs> and <laughs> we, we uh, did our, our master's degrees at the Graduate Theological Union. And in 1982, at the end of my husband's MA, Professor Jacob Milgram from the University of California at Berkeley recommended that we go study in Israel for one year to work on modern Hebrew and study with some of the Jewish scholars at Hebrew University before my husband would come back and do his PhD with Professor Milgram at Cal Berkeley. Now, some of you may know who Milgram is. He's the man who wrote the three-volume commentary on the book of Leviticus in the Anchor Bible Commentary series. You know, three volumes on Leviticus, when usually most commentary series have one little tiny thin volume, is pretty amazing. And he was an amazing teacher. What Milgram didn't count on and what we didn't count on was that stepping into Israel and into Jerusalem and studying there was like walking into Disneyland in the most positive sense of the word. Everywhere you turn, there is something that makes the biblical text come alive. It can be archeology, span it could be language, it could be history, it could be the interaction between Jews and Gentiles. But there is an aspect to living in the land of the Bible, which makes it a classroom like no other. So at the end of that first year, after having just this fabulous time, we really prayed about the next step. Should we go back to California and do the PhD or should we stay in Jerusalem and do the PhD at Hebrew University? And my husband felt very strongly and I concurred that we should stay in Jerusalem. So that was chapter two. We let the family know we're going to be gone for five to seven years, do the PhD. And they, they were all good with it. They were very supportive. But in the course of that time, as we started in this PhD program, and we got to know our fellow journeyers along the way, people like Brad Young and Jerry Lund and subsequently Steve Notley and David Biven and Halver Ronning, Weston Fields, we, we would gather in our little living room and we would talk about how great it is for Christian scholars to really explore more deeply the Jewish backgrounds of their faith, something that you guys are already all on board with. But what we saw as the real difficulty was that most Christian scholars don't have time to learn modern Hebrew and study at Hebrew University with the Jewish scholars there. But we realized, of course, that all of the scholars speak English. So why not put together a curriculum in English that would hire people like Emmanuel Tove to teach the Septuagint or Michael Stone to teach apocalyptic literature and, and do a curriculum of courses that would really be essential to understanding the world of Jesus and the world of the New Testament and that emerging thing. And so after all of these discussions, we felt in the Lord we should start this school. And we just started with one focus, earliest Christianity. You know that that period, that first generation, those decades following the, the death and resurrection of Jesus, that was the period that seemed to get the least amount of focus in classical seminary educations. People sort of jumped to the church fathers in the early second century, but we wanted to experience what was happening. We wanted to really explore you know, that period of time where Paul was walking around and where Barnabas was, you know, ministering and, and living in 
the context of Israel. Okay, so that is to say we started the school back in 1986 as the Center for the Study of Early Christianity. We incorporated in California, and now it's the University of the Holy Land. The rest is on the website, www.uhl.ac. And as we started the school, then my sister said to me, so you're really not ever coming back, are you? <laughs> and we said, well, we could be there for a long time, you know, maybe, who knows how long the Lord will let us be there, but so far it's 33 years since we went to Israel. And all of our kids were born there, and the rest is history. Okay, the thing that happened as we started living life there the first year when we didn't think we were staying, you know, it was just that year abroad, we didn't really find a church home. It was a period of intense academic work. But once we knew we were going to stay, we really needed to find a church home. And right at that moment, God was moving on Jim Cantillon and Wayne Hilsden, the founders of what is now called King of Kings, to begin a Bible study at Hebrew University. And we were just blessed to be able to become part of that particular Bible study and subsequently to be one of the founding families. There were seven. There was Mervyn Merla Watson and Bill and Shirley Wolford. These are people who are associated with the founding of the International Christian Embassy. And Wayne and Ann and Jim and Kathy Cantillon and ourselves and Ted and Linda Walker. And we were the beginning families and it gave us a place that we were planted. And we started having services in the YMCA and teaching Bible studies. My husband is Steve. We got to start to know the varieties of Messianic believers. And what, lo and behold, shock, shock, there were as many kinds of Messianic believers as there were Jews. You know, the same. If you have one Jew or two Jews in a room, you'll have three or four opinions. So I don't know why I was so naive. Why did I think that all Jews would think alike when they came to the Lord? What, what was I thinking? Why would I think that all Jews would experience their experience in the Messiah the same and that there would somehow be unity on practice, whether or not you keep Shabbat, whether or not you keep kosher? We found out that who they were before they came in, in terms of their Jewish identity, often carried right over into who they were in the Messiah. And raging debates existed, friendly but raging, <laughs> you know, about whether or not a Messianic believer should observe Shabbat. Should they drive their car on Shabbat? Because turning on that engine is like lighting a fire, right? There's a spark. Or, you know, keep their light switch on and not turn it off during Shabbat, maintaining that stasis. Should they keep kosher? What level of kosher should they keep? Do they do glot kosher, which is the most extreme? Do they do some kosher? Did Jesus declare all foods clean and you can eat anything you want? These issues really were current issues. And then as you start finding out that there's this whole world of Jewish believers and they have diversity of opinion and diversity of practice, with the exception that everybody circumcises their sons. And most everybody tries to do it on the eighth day. That is one thing across the board that you don't find ignored. In the midst of that, then you're growing a congregation that is comprised of both varieties of Messianic believers and Gentile Christians. And now you come to the next big issue, which is how do we have table fellowship? If you're going to have a potluck dinner and, you know, after service, and you are going to have present Messianic believers who keep kosher, together with Gentile Christians who don't, how do you accommodate each other's practice? Well, we have some very clear principles in Scripture that suddenly became quite concrete discussions for us living in Jerusalem in a context where really for the first time I was able to experience what it meant for Jews and Gentiles to come together in the body of Messiah and experience fellowship while respecting identity. And it's not a small thing. Obviously the answer is if you're going to have a potluck dinner, your safest bet is to go dairy, fish, vegetarian. And that's easier than going meat because side dishes often need something that has milk products in it. So if you go dairy potluck with fish, 
then you can be sure that you're, you're keeping kosher and everybody can be happy, right? Why do we say that? If you remember this discussion that Paul has in Romans 14 to 15 and a discussion in 1 Corinthians 7, Paul is writing both of these letters towards the conclusion of his ministry, his pastoral ministry, although he expects to go on to Spain and he's going to, you know, evangelize Spain, but he ends up in prison and then probably gets set free and maybe does make it to Spain eventually. But he's writing after a good 15 years of ministry. He's a seasoned pastor. So first I'm going to read a little bit from 1 Corinthians 7. And if we were reading 1 Corinthians 7, and I said to you, 1 Corinthians 7, the first thing you would say is, oh, it's about marriage. Right, it's about whether or not you should get married because of the impending distress. And that's the thing that pops into your mind. But right in the middle of 1 Corinthians 7 is an amazing passage that gets overlooked. And it is born, I think it's it's more solid than the part about marriage. Because that was Paul's opinion about the impending distress. But I think in 1 Corinthians 7, 17 and following, he gives sage counsel as a person who has ministered internationally among Jews and Gentiles and had to try to help nurture congregations and to help people find their identity in the Messiah. And this is what he says in 1 Corinthians 7, 17. Only let everyone lead the life which the Lord has assigned to him and in which God has called him. You were born exactly who God wanted you to be born. And you were born a Jew or a Gentile because God wanted you to be a Jew or a Gentile. It's not a better or a worse. It is where God wants you. And God has assigned this identity to you. This is my rule. This is my counsel. This is my advice in all the churches. Was anyone at the time of his call already circumcised? Let him not seek to remove the marks of circumcision. Was anyone at the time of his call uncircumcised? Let him not seek circumcision. Were you born a Jew? Well, when you come to know the Messiah, Jesus, don't feel pressured to put off your Jewish identity. You get to remain Jewish in all of its richness and all of its challenges. Were you a Gentile when you came to know the Lord Jesus? You get to remain a Gentile and you don't have to convert. Now, Paul says in verse 19, For neither circumcision counts for anything nor uncircumcision, but keeping the commandments of God. Everyone should remain in the state in which he was called. I I think that he's saying, for neither circumcision counts for anything nor uncircumcision. He means these are not earning you points before God. God's love for you is already absolute. He already gave his son for you, and you are who you are supposed to be in the Lord. There's not a a theological abstract reason why one is better than the other. I think his advice is practical. I think he realizes that if you grew up keeping kosher your whole life, and you never ate pork, and you grew up in a kitchen that had two sinks, two refrigerators, and two sets of dishes, for you to suddenly think that because you are free in Christ and all food is clean, you have to go eat pork, will create a crisis of conscience. It doesn't matter. It, it, even if you know intellectually that you're free to eat whatever you want, internally you feel uncomfortable. You feel compromised and you feel unclean. It's kind of icky. you know. Or to stop uh, separating meat from dairy, if that is how you grew up. Paul sees that type of a goal setting aside that old and taking on this new so-called freedom to actually be a distraction from the more important things, keeping the commandments of God, to love one another, to bring the good news of Jesus, to tell people that they have a destiny in God to be achieved and met. So if you were circumcised, if you were Jewish, if you were observant, don't seek to become Gentilized. You don't have to. You can keep that comfort level of observance. But if you were a Gentile, if you were uncircumcised when you were called, don't seek circumcision because he sees the reverse is true. For the Gentile who grew up secular, grew up without 
the halakha, the observances, to suddenly make his focus trying to keep all the observances, learning to keep his food separate, thinking about how much time should go between eating a meat dinner and having a dairy dessert, you know. Do I have to kosherize dishes at Passover? All of the different things. What about turning on that light switch? Uh Uh-oh. That becomes a distraction, and it becomes legalism, because it is not about the practice. It is about the commandments of God. And I don't think he means the commandments in a legalistic sense. He means, you know, sharing the good news, living a holy life, caring for those. What did Jesus want us to do? Clothe the naked, feed the hungry, comfort those who mourn. Be his hands and feet, heart and eyes in the world, his voice in the world. So Paul is a very experienced and wise pastor when he says this. And this issue cuts at the heart of of the emerging earliest generation of believers in Jesus who are trying to find their way as something extraordinary and something new. And we're going to look at that in the pages of the Acts of the Apostles in a moment. But he brings out this kind of balance. And in Romans 14 to 15, by the way, we'll just say in 1 Corinthians 17, he does have one exception. If you're a slave and you can be set free, you should go for it. Now, that sounds shocking to us because obviously you would think that if you were a slave and you could be set free, you should go for it. But no, he has to say that to them. Why is that? It's because in the first century, if you were a slave, you know, working for a Roman master, being part of a villa estate, you had a bed to sleep in, you had your two or three meals a day, you had clothing. You might have a little stipend, and you might be able to actually graduate into a better life financially. You had responsibility. You had security. So you could be hard-pressed if you were a, a household slave or a slave who had status to actually step out and risk it all and be on your own out there in the world and have to find your way. And so that, I think, is the reason that he encourages the slaves. You can be a slave, but if you are set free from the Lord, then you will have autonomy. You will have that independence to be able to travel, to be able to minister, to be able to call the shots on your time, etc. But there's a risk involved for the freed man who has been a slave up till now.